Hi, this is your host, Sapin Bhartia, and welcome to another episode of TFR. Let's talk. And today we have with us Glenn Russell, head of delivery at Caddick Group. Glenn, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, and today's topic is more or less about you know how to you know retain or keep your developers. There are so many reasons why folks are switching jobs. A lot of folks are quitting as well in the in the tech space. There are so many reasons. So, uh, <laughs> head of AI and ML at Apple could because they're forced to um, uh, go back to office. People want to work remotely from home. Uh, burnout is also happening because of COVID. Everybody's moving to the cloud. What are the other factors that play a role where people get burned out and you know they want to move or quit and what companies can do to keep them? Sure, well, it's a, it's a great question. And I think that there's many facets uh, to an answer. But ultimately, when it boils down to it is, are you actually letting your developers do their job? Um, and I think what we see uh, frequently uh, at Carrick is we go into many companies who are successful companies, let's not, let's not uh, misrepresent, but they have high attrition. And um, in many regards, I think there's something of a, of a Stockholm syndrome in place where when, um, when you initially engage with these developer teams, there's almost a an acceptance that these are the, this is the way things have to be. So let me let, let me talk about the, the the biggest example. For example, VDIs. This is a mechanism by which you know developers are typically onboarded to a large company. It's a highly restricted environment. Doing anything in that sandbox might be safe from a security point of view, but from a developer productivity point of view, it's something that you're instantly fighting against from the moment you work for a company. And by far and away, the biggest uh, cause that we see for attrition at many different enterprises is a company cannot get out of the way its developers and security is a big part of that. Um, and, and let's talk about the other significant challenge. It's no secret that uh, cyber specifically, cyber security in, in all its facets, not just AppSec or InfoSec or NetSec, is suffering from a, a chronic talent shortage. Um, even, even in a study like Belfast where I'm based, where we have many security companies, uh, there are many more open positions than there, are, there actually are uh, uh, people. And, and so what's the obvious answer here really is to have people who uh, have a company that gets out of the way it's developers, but at the same time, development teams need to start to accept more responsibility for the security of their, of their applications. Right. Uh, you touched upon it initially, you know, that let developers uh, do their uh, job. Now, uh, there are a couple of things that it comes, you know, when either you let developers do their job or developers feel that, hey, they can do their job without having to worry. So uh, it's about uh, it's mutual trust, right? And it's also kind of freedom of being able to do. It's about either you put the gates or you put guardrails. It's all about control as well. So talk about those aspects. So I think, th let's be clear, the challenges facing application teams have got worse uh, since the advent of, of cloud and, and public cloud. Um, Really, I'm going to focus on the infrastructure, and I know this isn't strictly the application teams themselves, but it, the, the fact is that you take the typical software vulnerability like, um, like, like log, for log for shell or um, Heartbleed. The infrastructure really amplifies those vulnerabilities more and more rather than dampen them. What I mean by that is um, if, you, if you were to some, maybe cynically look at how we distribute software today, um, really what we have is a really potent vulnerability delivery mechanism. Um, I remember, for example, early in my career, burning software on a CD and traveling on a plane to a customer to install a piece of software. Now I just have to make it available on GitHub and I can you know, somewhat guarantee that someone's going to download it, not knowing what's in that piece of software. So increasingly, we have to look at the supply chain itself and say, well, how can we secure this? How can we make that safer while getting out of the way of our development teams? When we look at software supply chain, uh, why it matters today? Of course, in the old days, you had one monolith. Everything was coming from one source. Today, you have so many dependencies, so many libraries, open source technologies are being used. Uh, so, so I want to first talk about why uh, we need to understand. Second would be that how much awareness is there about software supply chain? Sometimes what happens is folks will say, hey, we just downloaded that, that image, Docker image or you know container image from GitHub and we are using it. They have no clue what is in there, where the hard links that can be changed, where, where the source is coming from. They It may not even just be about security. It could also be about compliance, about the open source code base that can be used there. You may be safe now, but when you build a company and five years down the line, somebody's going to acquire you and they look at the code base and they're like, hey, you know what? You're not even compatible. So, so talk about these two aspects. 
So let's talk about, I mean, my view here, this is a perfect storm of, um, of, uh, of an, of an inability to manage risk. Uh, and let me, let me talk about that. Um, I know it sounds very grandiose, but we can bring it down to actual cases. So you're perfectly right in what you say. Uh, more and more, it's not just, you're not just bringing together software from one company or one entity, it's many. And although we kind of maybe understand that the, under, that the, uh, that, that the mantra of open source is to make software freely available to, uh, to everyone, that might be true to some regard, but now what we've done is we've expanded our attack surface to, be, to encompass many, many different people with many different opinions, many different political backgrounds, and I don't want to get into that, but the reality is that um, we've seen a, a number of documented cases where um, a developer has decided that they no longer want to support a piece of software, um, and they've, they've actually sabotaged it. And even, uh, I'm sure you are well aware of the, of the left pad library and NPM, that one change for a really innocuous piece of software uh, killed productivity um, at many, many different companies. And it's not a traditional software vulnerability. That's why I say risk. It's not like somebody trying to pop a shell on a, on a VM or perform a SQL injection attack. It's very much, it's, it's almost a vulnerability in people, if you know what I mean. But now we're all, more and more, we're more subject to it. And that's why I say, uh, current software development methods have become an amplifier for all kinds of risk rather than helping us. Um, uh, hopefully that answers your questions, uh, Swapnil. <laughs> I'm happy to expand any other points. Excellent. Uh, thanks for you know uh, taking that question. Now, one more thing that you were talking about, you gave an example of, uh, you know, for political reasons, folks can, you know, just one line and it could have devastating effect. Uh, but the fact is that we have not fully understand the risks that are there. Okay, uh, and once again, it does, doesn't matter what your political leaning is. If you block access to, uh, you know, X country or, you know, region, I don't know, government agency, whatever it is, it could not be just disruption in access to the software. What if it, it was a library or package that was used for security, like you will expose you know, user data to every, so we don't even know the risk. So can you just quickly give us you know, a picture about you know, what are the risks there, and then we'll talk about what companies can do to you know, put some safety nets there, but let's talk about the risks. Well, the, the risks are that um, you, know, you, could, uh, you could have an artifact repository, which if we're talking about the broader topic of the, so the secure software supply chain, and, um, and that's really the discipline of how you take a piece of software and you build it. You basically are um, super specific about which patencies you build into that library. Um, then when you actually build that piece of software, which could be you know, a, a hermetic build, something like which Bazel does for you. Um, and then you could even introduce, if you're more advanced, you could do something like the binary authorization that says, I have to sign this piece of software to run it. Even after all that, and that's a, that's a big assumption, by the way, um, you could still be in a scenario where you've installed a piece of software, which may even have a, a secure library, for example. Um, you could still be in a position where you have a zero day of vulnerability in your infrastructure uh, and you didn't know about it. You know, log for shell is, is a prime example. Uh, Heartbleed uh, was in the uh, OpenSSL code for years before anyone detected it. So, so let's talk about how we should then think about that. What, and again, back to my comment, our, the, our way of building software right now has become a way to, to amplify those vulner, vulnerabilities. So in my mind, there's, there's three things um, um, that really we need to talk about. And it's, it's going to come back to, to, to putting the, the, the responsibility at the feet of developers. Number one, a breach first mentality. Build your software and deploy your software that assumes that um, it's under attack immediately. And that might be purely a, an internal attack. But the reason we say that is because that gets us into the mindset of saying, how would I recover from bad data? How would I recover from a DDoS attack, for example? Even internally, um, you know, um, because as, as, as has been proven by many breaches over the past few years, um, where a, a hacker gets access to a piece of software, um, they traverse throughout um, uh, uh, the entire infrastructure. But more often than not, it's a valid set of credentials, which is from an internal attacker. Which brings me on to the second point, and that's the principal at least privilege. Application teams, they need to think about um, what per, what's the minimal set of permissions I actually need to, to use um, to actually do my job. Um, now, 
bringing this back to the um, to the, the broader topic of of developer attrition, I think that these kinds of guardrails are things which can be really uh, done once and replicated across application teams. But I think there's challenges around the heterogeneity of, of environments overall. But my last point in this uh, swap mill is it's adopting a defense in depth uh, uh, posture, and that is. Okay, I, I'm protecting the application here, but what if this control fails? What's my what's my backup? And that could be as simple as well, close all my open ports. But you know what? If if an attacker does find a way through the network, well, how can I protect that data? Um, how can I provide access to that data so that it's not compromised? You know, and there are many different what we call compensating controls. And compensating controls are things which rarely I think application teams think about. Uh, but again, this is why it comes back to um, uh, an education mindset, first and foremost, because we are not going to uh, find 500,000 cyber specialists in the next year or two. And meanwhile, um, uh, you know, nation states down to a script kitty who finds some of the internet are attacking our applications. Now, I'll, f I'll finish off, if I may, by saying um, this is a hard problem. And, and any security vendor that's telling you that they have this magic box, which fixes all this for you, is either ill-informed or, or being deceptive. But if we solve this pro core problem of make, give us guardrails, give us sensible defaults and a sensible configuration so we can get out of the way of our developers so they can write code, I think we'll, we'll make big inroads to develop it, or address it, the developer attrition problem. As you're talking about, you know, they're not enough you know, cybersecurity expert and also, uh, Security folks, DevSecOps folks, they love you know security. That's their passion, but not everybody, not developers. Sometimes you know uh, this could be a drain on their you know resources, energy. It, it affects you know productivity as well. Uh, so can you also talk a bit about you did touch upon in great details, but if I can ask you know just to summarize, yeah, share some points, not essentially a whole playbook. That what what can be done to kind of so that the, there's a fine balance between security productivity, and also developer experience? Well, I think that starts with just understanding where any given application um, stands today. And that could be, for example, the number of open security issues. It could be uh, another good metric, for example, is, um, is how long it takes to close any given security issue. Um, and I think the suggestion I'd make to, to any team, and again, I'm talking to an, an average application team here. I'm not talking to one that's running COBOL or, or on the other hand, one that's running Kubernetes all day. It's just understanding where you are right now. So that helps you understand where you have to make the biggest impact. Because obsessing about a vulnerability, which in reality is not exploitable, or at least as a lesser risk, is, is a waste of time. And using metrics like that, uh, the intent would be that you focus on the security issues that matter most uh, to any given application team. And that's that's not a technical answer. I realize that, but because it's not a technical solution, it's a it's a it's a it's a mindset in the team itself that needs to change in order to help uh, achieve that balance. Other than a, a, other, otherwise, uh, teams will be faced with the constant uh, brick wall of the security operations team saying no to everything. And that, that only goes one way, as we've discussed already. Since you folks work very closely with your customers and, of course, clients, you have tech solutions everywhere. What do you do to, to bring cultural change there? Well, it has to start at the top. I mean, I think it, it goes with any kind of, really any kind of technology initiative or, um, uh, uh, or, or overall change in how a team works, even even let's talk about a transition to agile, is going to fail out of the gate uh, if you don't have buy-in from an exact team down, uh, because it, everything come, let's face it comes down to money, and you need the funding and you need the backing. So I think for me, if I'm not talking to a CISO, for example, and that can be a technical CISO or an executive CISO, I need to be able to pitch to them and say, these this is the problem I'm trying to solve realistically, this is where we can get to and then having, having an honest conversation because unfortunately, um, I, I'm sure as you well know, nobody, everybody wants security, but nobody really wants to pay for it. And part of the problem is that the, the, the average C-suite doesn't know where to spend money to get the maximum impact of that investment. Um, and that is really the conversation that we have with our customers. Now, that, does that require deep technical expertise of how GCP works, how AppSec works, how networks work? Yes, it does. Uh, but ultimately, it all comes back to 
uh, a business problem of, and it relates to one of managing risk, of course, but that has, is a story that has to come from the top down. Again, a people problem. Glenn, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about this topic. We don't talk about this aspect of, you know, attrition and, you know, of course, talent retention, but uh, it was uh, really incredible that you touched upon those things and also share some tips what companies can do, developer team can do. So that was incredible. And once again, I would love to have you back on the show to discuss another aspect of, you know, developer productivity and how companies can become more efficient. But I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you.